This is another model railroad construction video. This time we're going to continue the work we were doing a couple of days ago, uh, building the scenery around the maintenance of way track. Let me show you what I'm talking about. As you may remember, we, we cut out and installed a turnout right in this area. And since, uh, since our video, why is that so stiff? There we go. Now we see we put the turnout right in here. And since then, I glued down the turnout and glued down some craft foam in this area. And we can remove all these um, weights to start off with. And then you can see where things stand. I want to do a little scenery design work today, so feel free to weigh in with your opinions. Um, and I'll try to keep a better eye on the chat. I like to use that um, yeah, container full of um, lead shot. I like to use that uh, for weighing down the center of the turnout because sometimes it's a little reluctant to stay all the way down, but when you weigh it really heavily, it usually works fine. Once in a while, when you put weights on like this, it can glue, it can stick to the thing you're, you're gluing, but I didn't have any of that problem today. So we'll be thankful for small things. All right, that was the weights. And I spent a little time on this, adjusting this throw. It used to be that this ground throw was on this side, but I wanted to move it over on this side um, in order to make room for the track in here, which sits in like that. Now, um, of course, the reason I wanted to move this, just, just another thing to note, there's no room in here to put the ground throw. I mean, I theoretically could have, or I could have moved the track over. Um, one of one of the uh, design issues around ground throws is you want to make it, I mean, like the prototype, uh, easy to walk from one ground throw to the next for the crews on the ground. So if you can see down the line here, um, I, uh, as you may have w watched in the past, or recent past, I set up this ladder here with these three switches. So I wanted to have the ground throws for all three of them on the same side so that the brakeman could walk back and forth and easily switch without the train getting in the way, wherever that was. Now that normally is the rule that I try to follow, but in this case, with the track right next to it, I made an exception to the rule and put it over here. Um, no big deal. Uh, just wanted to point it out. Uh, the other thing that I think we could do right now, we're just going to advance the project today. So hope you don't mind my jumping around a little bit. Um, so I'm going to cut. We've got this uh, track pretty much in position. I'm going to cut the uh, cut it off so that it it stops. But I want to leave a little room. I want to leave some extra rail out because I'm thinking about putting a, an end bumper in uh, that uses the rail bent up. Now maybe that's silly because for an MOW track, they might have just stacked some ties and called that good for the end bumper. But this is a spot right next to the edge of the layout uh, where details can be kind of cool. So I have an old uh, uh, end bumper casting that I think I got in high school, some, whatever that was, uh, 
55 years ago. And I still have it, and I'm thinking of installing it right here because that would be a nice um, memory for me. And it would be something that people would say, oh, where did you get that? I never saw that in bumper. No kidding. It was, you know, something model railroaders were using back in the 60s. Anyway, so what I'm trying to say is I'm going to cut the last tie off where it might rest but then we're going to uh, put the bumper next to that. So looking at the, the alignment here, it looks like our last tie could be about here. Can you see what I'm doing? I'm cutting the web on the bottom of the track. But then what I'm going to do is come up here and cut the rail a little farther up so that I have the option of bending it. Um, so I've just cut that little piece of track off. And now I'm going to remove these ties off this code 55 flex track. Just like that. And what we have now is the the rail i can bend the rail up later when i'm playing with the uh, end bumper and and uh, uh, that's a that's another project now one thing i do notice here is that i didn't finish leveling this area which is some um, spackle and so that's something we can do um, uh, with some some additional tool i'm not sure exactly what yet but we'll think of it. But anyway, that's not what I wanted to work on today right away anyway. Um, let's turn our attention to the other side of this new track. And by the way, I don't think I said um, uh, anything about this yet, but uh, while you were gone, I, I went ahead and installed uh, these uh, sheets of pink foam right here. Uh, and the main reason I did it this way was because I had the foam on hand in, in the right size, or roughly. And I wanted this surface for the track to be a little lower than the main track, because this is a maintenance away track off to the side. So uh, it happened that two pieces of this two millimeter foam was a little less thick than the cork that um, the roadbed here was made out of. So this gave me a slight uh, downgrade. And when we're dropping a car off, the car will be able to roll down and stay down and it won't, we won't have to worry about it coming up onto the main track because it'll be slightly lower. It'll, it'll just look scenically cooler that way. Anyway, that, that's clear. So now for the design question. The design question is, what are we doing with this hillside? Um, the last time we, you know, we cut the, the foam off down to the plywood, which you can see here. And I just cut it off because I had the saw and I wanted to do the design work later. Now, as I've thought about this, and so clearly we can shape the hillside, and I'll show you what I mean. We can just take this red scraper and we can shape the hillside until we have a curve that we like. And then we can put in the, the um, you know, put the paint and finish it up. But the more I thought about this, I thought, you know, we need space down here for trucks and supplies and whatever. And what if we were to curve it around? It would It would be a curved retaining wall instead of a straight retaining wall. And I think that would look a lot more interesting and it would fit in with the bridge because we've got a bridge here and um, I guess I guess you'd call this, uh, uh, what's the word, Design. we're designing out loud here because I didn't have a predetermined uh, plan for how, how to make this. But see the bridge is, the bridge looks great, 
the contour next to the bridge is a slope that goes down and gets a little steeper. So it looks like it might need a retaining wall. Um, and the reason it's not, any, well, it looks better with this sort of a 45 degree angle, um, more realistic but I didn't have room to take it all the way over. So I made it a little steeper here, but now I'm thinking, well, that's wrong. We need a retaining wall for something that steep. And if we have a retaining wall for the part here under the bridge, we might as well bring the retaining wall all the way around instead of this odd looking uh, uh, corner that, that doesn't make any sense. So having thought that, to death. I'm going to take this curved saw and I'm going to try just putting a curve in here. Can you see that? This is one of those flexible saws. I'm going to try this. I, there are other ways we could do it, but I'm just thinking, let's try this curved. I'm going to try to keep it somewhat um, vertical. Just cut it in there and cut a curved um, vertical surface for a retaining wall. And um, Tomorrow is uh, Tuesday, and a friend of mine named Dave Anger is coming over to work on the railroad. And I know he just loves building retaining walls, so he'll just get really excited when he sees this. We won't put, we won't install the retaining wall today, but be prepared to see that later. So, what do you think? Is that just going to pop out? Yeah, see, what do you think? I think that looks way better. And from various angles, as you're watching a train, um, if you're running a train, see, I'll show you different angles. You'll be following the train in your with your eye, and this retaining wall will just curve around to meet the track. I, I just I think that's a much better approach. I really do. Now there's still a question of is it, did we go far enough with it? And I'm I'm not really sure about that. I, I have a feeling like we could go a little farther. Um, this is another one of those millions of situations where it really doesn't matter. Just do it and get it over with. But I I think that a little bit farther is worth doing. So we're going to do it. I guess if I'm the designer, I can make these decisions all day long. Let me look and see if you've commented on it. Hello, Randall. The club layout has an overpass almost exactly like this. Nice. Yeah, I think overpasses add a lot to a model railroad. You get the feeling that the train is going somewhere. Now this is a little, yeah, so we got that out of there. Now the, the uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Uh, spackle. I use spackle to, as a scenic me uh, material here. So I'm just taking it out because we'll have some we'll have some uh, gravel in here. The other thing I should take out while we're while we're fussing with this, I should take my Exacto knife. Did we decide last time that this is the most valuable tool on a model railroad? So um, I'm going to cut this. Oh, you can't really see what I'm doing, can you? And you might not care either. And that's a whole other story. But anyway, I'll move this so you can see a little bit better what I'm doing. This uh, is cork that I glued down when I glued the turnout down, but it doesn't need to be this uh, this far. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hold this down and cut a angle. If I do this right, I'll cut my finger. I'm just gonna cut an angle where the ties are see that and just come right into the um, where the pavement is and then we can get rid of this extra that'll mean we can bring even just fill in gravel here when we get around to the ballasting i'm not really doing anything very scientific here i just want to get a curved um cork edge you know like you have with roadbed so clearly we've got the gravel built up to support the, the turnout but we want to curve over to whatever the 
uh, underlying pavement is. And I don't think we need that pin anymore. But uh, that's fine. So that's uh, looking pretty good. I think it's looking pretty good. So I guess I have no choice but to plug in the, the uh, vacuum cleaner and clean that mess up. All I have to do is find the end of the cord without Oh, the vacuum cleaner is already plugged in. All right. It means to uh, and we have two different things to do right now, completely different things. And at the moment I've forgotten both of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, okay, here's the next design question. Well, all right, no, sorry, I'm changing my mind. So let's finish off this hillside. It's nice to do um, nice to start and finish something rather than just keep battering around. I, I never thought of myself having ADD until I started trying to film videos, and then I thought, hey, just jump around an awful lot. Okay. Um, uh, welcome, James. Glad you could be here. Um, let's see. So I like this. I like this retaining wall. This is going to be very cool when it's got some brick or random stone or something along here. That's going to be super cool. But what about the contours of this? Is this smooth enough? That's the question. That's the question. Is it smooth enough? Um, do we need to make changes to it? I see. I'm thinking the slope is just fine. It kind of makes in here. I think we don't have to do much. I was thinking we were going to be doing a lot more surgery here, but as I look at this, I think we can just take our take our scraper tool and we can just make a little bit more gradual radius to the hillside. We're not trying to draw attention to this. We're just trying to, yeah, we're just trying to match it up with the fascia and Yeah, yeah, I, I'm happy with this. You are. Now the the question is, do we have to put some? We have to put some spackle in the hole here, and the answer is yes. Of course we do. Okay, so let's vacuum that one more time, and we'll go get the spackle. <clears throat> if you watch this long enough. All right, I'll be right back with a spackle and then we'll fix this up, which will be good because then it can dry and then we can uh, paint it a little later. The good thing about spackle is it doesn't take that long to uh, dry. One of the miracles of model railroading is when you can find what you need without a five to 10 or 20 minute search through all your, your miscellaneous stuff. So look at that, a little spackle, Red Devil. I'm not sure what brand this is. 
Now it looks a little bit on the uh, uh, granular side. Oh, I didn't get my favorite spackling tool, which is a little uh, spatula, little tiny spatula. And we better get that. I know I keep talking about most valuable tools, but some of these things have really turned in handy. I don't know what you call this, but it's some kind of a little, uh, it's a little spatula, it's very flexible. It's really good for, for this kind of thing. Can you see, see the edge here? Yeah, you can see it. Any more comments from the peanut gallery? Uh, so the question is, is this, does this need more water or can we use it as is? And I, I think it's all right as is. It looks a little funny, but I think it's fine. Sometimes when I start a scenery project, I'll go and just dribble some water in here from the uh, sink. Um, but I think this is, this looks like it's good enough. Now, of course, when we put um, paint on it, it will um, the paint will act like glue in a variety of ways, but one of the ways is it will glue uh, to, uh, onto the uh, front fascia, which is kind of nice. The one also one nice thing about it being this uh, um, un putty like is that uh, it rolls; it doesn't stick to the any surface you don't want it to stick to. Now, the other side of that is that I, I want the ground to be reasonably textured so it looks like dirt. But this this is not a, um, a high, uh, what's the word, a highly artistic um, scenery area. This is just, uh, a little spot in between some uh, railroad action. So I don't really want your, your eye to be drawn to this particularly. I just want it to go away visually. And so having a, just a sloped hillside is fine. Now, uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, what about bushes and things like that? And of course the answer is yes, we'll come through here and put some bushes in. But the main thing was just to get the, the hillside smoothed up and it doesn't, like I said, I don't have to get every single um, little dip in here uh, filled with spackle. I'm just trying to generally get the idea that it's a, a smooth hillside. Now, we'll, um, we're going to go on to some other things and come back, let this dry a little bit, and then we'll get the, the uh, brown paint and we can paint this up and put the ground cover on it and tomorrow it'll look just like it's always been just like this and we'll never be able to believe that it was bare foam the day before we won't be able to believe it i really like using foam for scenery because it, it, you can do exactly what we're doing today which is go back 10 years later and change something with an absolute minimum of fuss Okay, so what I'm saying is that's ready to paint as soon as it dries a little bit. And um, we didn't even have to remix the spackle this time. Like I said, normally I spend five minutes getting the spackle just right because it's usually been months or years since I got the spackle out. And so it tends to dry up. Now, you know, you I could make an argument that while we're spackling, we ought to do a little crack down here. The thing is, can you see that? Try using a craft stick to spread the spackle. Yeah, well, this, yeah, this work. I know, yeah, a craft stick would be fine. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the same size. Well, I guess it's accomplishing about the same thing. I'm, I'm, I just realized that 
it made sense for me to level this out. I don't think it makes sense to, um, I don't know, I'm not gonna do any more speckling right now, except, because even this crack here is gonna be casting where the rock wall, whatever that is, will probably put some gravel down too. So I'm starting to just waste my time here. Let's not do any more of that. Let's just review the situation. We have this ready for paint and we're gonna let it dry a little bit. Put the lid on the spackle, get it nice and <clears throat> airtight. All right, that's the spackle part of the, of the show. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to apply spacer ties. If, you, if we come back over to this switch that we did the other day, I don't know how many of you were here for the, or have seen the live stream we did the other day when we installed this switch in the middle of existing flex track, but clearly there's a couple missing ties. So what I do is I take a wood, a stained wood tie like this. You can buy them from various places. I take my needle nose pliers, I go to where the, about where the rail should be, and I squeeze it. Now what that does is to create a, uh, you see that? It creates a thinner part, which means that the rail joiner will not press up against the width of the tie. So I squeeze it in both places. Now I have a, a spacer tie, and so I can just shove that in there, and it will not put pressure on the, uh, rail joiner because of the squeezing that I just did. Now it looks like this turned out just great. We got room for one more tie there. And you'd never know this wasn't a plastic tie, but um, I just squeeze it where the rails go and stick it in there. Now this is a little bit dicey because um, this was previously glued down with Elmer's, so it's a little on the rock hard side. Okay, how do you like that? Pretty good. So now what about the other side? Well, we don't even have this track in yet, but we might as well put in another tie. Now, is this is this too long or is that going to be just right? Is that going to be just, oh, that's going to be just right. I want a darker tie though. Now I'm going to do the same thing here. Squeeze this guy and squeeze him there. And in this case, I could just slide him in, whatever works, and get it in place. And of course, once it's in place, you can glue it. But see how I messed up those over there? I need to glue these guys. Now, there's a couple of ways to do that. But before we do that, let's come over here and do the one on this side. Now this looks like we only have room for one. So we'll do our same little trick of squeezing the rail area. And I'll show you again, if you haven't understood what I'm doing. I'm making it, see I'm making it narrow, right where the rail joiner is, because we don't want to put upward pressure in the rail joiner. So I'm just inserting that in there and uh, it, it, it sits very happily without affecting the, um, without pushing the rail up, which we don't want, we don't want that because that would create uneven track work. Now I just noticed that the, the rail, head is a little bit uh, more, uh, there's a little burr on the top there. It's interesting. And it could have to do with the rail joiner that was soldered here. And I'm just making that, I'm sure that's even. You know, there's sort of no end to getting your track work perfect. 
But when you find a little rough edge like that, you can go in with a file and all your operators will be happy for the rest of your life because they didn't have to put, worry about the wheels going click click and saying, is there something wrong? Okay, so now that we've got that in place, the first thing I'm thinking is we ought to glue it and nothing else goes wrong. All right, so we'll grab our liquid latex, which we used for putting down the, the switch, and we'll just put a little bit of glue. We don't need much liquid latex here. I need a better, oof, I need a better uh, dispenser than this Subi honey thing, but that's all right. Now I'm going to move this bridge again because it's kind of in our way. Whoa! We lost the school bus over the hill. No good. All right. We recovered the school bus and no one was hurt. So I'll put a little bit more of this liquid latex on here. Now I, I could I could have put in um, Elmer's obviously, like we're doing with the ballast. There we go. But it doesn't matter. There are a lot of things that people fuss about that really don't matter too much. There, but again, to repeat what I said the other day, the reason I like liquid latex is when this sets, it is not water soluble. Uh, I want to stress that because when Elmer's glue sets, it's rock hard. But if you wet it down with water, it becomes loose again, which is wonderful for most things but not particularly, you don't want your track coming up when you when you wet all your ballast to, to do something different with it. So um, I, I pat it a little bit to get any liquid latex off the top of the tie. I learned the hard way that it's easier to do it that way than to cut it off later. Okay, so we like that a lot, don't we? See if we have any comments. Um, well, I like it so much. I think I'm going to go get the paint, the, the brown paint, and we'll do some scenery uh, since that's what we were planning to do anyway. We'll do a little of what we, what's called zip texturing. So, green tools of zip, zip texturing are some grass colored turf and some dirt colored turf. This is this happens to be Woodland Scenics um, Green Blend and Earth Blend. You can see that. I buy it in these large jars, but if you don't have that big a layout, you don't really need to do that. And I'm going to pull you away just slightly because um, you want to be able to see the whole operation. Now, um, we're going to go get the paint and a brush. And we're going to do what I call zip texturing. I'm not the first person that called it that. And the idea is it goes so fast. It's, you do it in a zip, in a jiffy, a zip, a zip. You zip text. Okay, so paint brushes. We need a little paintbrush, and we need a little brown paint. There we go. We'll shake up the paint. See, I'm shaking up the paint. <laughs> Seems like a good idea probably been a while. And now we can open the paint and any old brown paint will do for this. And you can pretty much open it with any old screwdriver.
I can't remember where I got the idea. This says nut brown. If you want to see the numbers on there, I can show you on the on the screen. There are the numbers for the different um, colors. You can go into a Home Depot and get this exact paint mixed up if you want it, or something else. So we'll just paint this. Now this is such a small amount, I may just take it off the top, off the lid. Can you see that? I mean, the lid is just gonna drip down anyway, so we'll just... Now, in my rush to get things done, I, I forgot to do one thing, which was to um, examine the angle on the front fascia. Remember the other day we cut it with a saber saw, uh, horizontal, but maybe we want the edge of the front fascia to be something other than horizontal. But uh, I guess if I was a perfectionist, I would not be doing this. So it looks pretty good though, without having examined it at all. Now there is no reason for me to paint um, where the where the um, retaining wall is going to go because that's going to get glued on there, except that until the retaining wall is glued, it would be kind of nice if it didn't look like blue foam. So what I tend to do, since I'm going to be sprinkling all this with ground cover anyway, Notice how we haven't even looked at the paint in the paint jar. We're just doing this. I'm going to go ahead and do this because I don't know how long it'll be before we get around to finishing this bottom. And that'll just add to the visual effect. Okay, so uh, what do you think? Do we need to, do we need to go around there? A little more. The problem is I don't really want to get paint on my on my nice uh, my nice um, pavement there. On the other hand, it's kind of nice to paint this. Of course, the other nice thing about painting this front edge is that it will adhere to whatever retaining wall. You know, this will just help the retaining wall glue. Whatever the glue is we use will help it. So I don't know how I managed to do that without ever even getting into the paint can, but that, there it is. So the first thing we're gonna do before we wash the brush and all that other stuff is we're gonna sprinkle our ground paint. Now I always start with dirt and I put the dirt on lightly uh, to create kind of an undercoat. Well, that doesn't look like I did it too lightly. But, but just, you want to get it une you want to do this unevenly, that's the key. Now I'm going to take the, can you see this all right? Yeah, look how fast this is going. So now I'm going to put this on. Now what happens is the, the wet paint will reach through that undercoat and grab onto some of this green coat, some of it. I'm putting on more than necessary. And what will happen later, tomorrow, I'll come back with a vacuum cleaner and a sock and suck up the extra. And then we'll just, it'll look exact. You can see it already looks exactly like the stuff that was there before. It's really kind of amazing how fast that, that's why they call it zip texturing. Now, obviously we could use a, uh, we could be doing static grass and we could be putting in clumps of bushes, but we can come back and do all that later. I'm not, I'm not worried about it. This is just the, um, you know, the first, uh, yeah, use a plastic eyedropper to dispense glue. Um, and you can clean the eyedropper with running cool water. These are good ideas. Um, now, the one thing I, I was thinking that I didn't like was I got paint on this area right here, which I might not want. Although that uh, craft foam is really not the final color that I think will end up. In fact, we may even... We may even have uh, uh, gravel 
I'll probably have gravel in this whole area. But just to be safe, I'm taking a wet paper towel and I'm just scraping off the the extra paint that we ended up with here. Because I don't I don't really think we want that. It's just an insurance program here. All right. I just I just pulled that back a little bit so it doesn't. When Dave gets around to uh, putting this retaining wall in, he'll probably do some other stuff in that corner. Now there's another thing that I think I'm going to mention, but probably do nothing about, and that is that we when we cut this. Uh, well, actually, it's good we're talking about this. When we cut this front edge, I think we cut it conservatively, a little higher above the scenery than needed. But part of the reason we did that was because, if you remember, we have these car card boxes here. Now we can get into a bunch of discussions about switchless versus car cards. We won't do that. But see, this, these car card boxes, we're going to put back on the front fascia. So we we made this just the right height so that it matches the car card boxes. And I'm reluctant to lower the card card boxes because there's a whole um, part of the layout down below this, which at the moment we call Lego Town because it's full of Legos from when my kids were young. But it's going to eventually be with uh, Harbor Island in West Seattle in, in uh, near downtown Seattle. But the point I'm making is that we, we want to be able to see underneath here. So if I were to lower this down, it's blocking the view of the lower deck. And so we're, we're having a trade-off situation here between the view of the lower deck, the view of the upper deck, and the the disadvantage of car cards that you junk up the front fascia with all of these boxes for car cards. So living with all these trade-offs, I'm happy with this front edge the way it is. And what I'm really thinking about now is, well, we're at it. Why don't we put uh, brown paint on there and sprinkle grass on it and have it be finished since we already went to the trouble of opening the paint? And part of the answer to the question is that we're not quite ready because we left some uh, of a, some bit of a problem over here. So I'm going to take my chisel, get rid of this spackle from previous construction. I'm just going to pull it away and. We've got the vacuum cleaner handy. So if we if we level this area, we don't really have to worry about either supporting the track or um, uh, painting it because we're going to ballast the track. So whatever's underneath the track is fine. It's just a question of how far do we need to go for the, for the ties, and we can. We can see that here. Ah, yes, we're almost there. We just need to cut a little bit of a of a cut here. Take out these little pieces of of um, ancient spackle, and our track might fit now down where we want it. Well, yes and no. Problem is the rail, we bent the rail. We had this rail straight. All right, I'm going to give up. I'm going to take my pliers and bend this rail because it's causing me a problem. So if I bend it off to the side, I'm just... Uh, I'm making an assumption that a bend like that will be close enough to what we need for the end bumper that I have. Now see, I can shove that over to the side and I'm almost clear, but not quite. Thanks for putting up with this little diversion. 
we're just taking away some more of this scenic material so that we can get the track as far over as we can, which is still not quite is. Oh yeah, there we go. So that's the, that's the idea, the end of track. I'll bend this other rail up uh, later when I have the actual end bumper to work with. And if later, if I wanna take some more of this scenery out, I can. Actually, I can see right now I want to, why do we need this extra scenery material just kind of making a mess of the scene there? Makes a lot more sense if it's just flat right up to the switch stand. And when we get to the switch stand, it's fine to have it be there. So, yeah, that's nice. So a little bit of, let's see, a little bit of um, vacuuming. And then we can do our little paint magic. Okay. Now, I wonder if you're thinking the same thing I'm thinking, which was that brush we were using before was awfully big. We need a smaller brush. We're doing a little more detailed work here. So it seems like a, a small flat brush is what we really want. So let's try this guy. Even this might be a little bigger than we want. Oof, I didn't fall down on my face. So I'm gonna use this, this smaller brush. Now it's still pretty big, but at least it's small. Here's the one we were using before. And it's, at least we'll have a little more control. Now we can get our, our paint back. I guess we need to change our angle. What are we doing? Oh yeah, we're painting here. We're painting the top of the fascia. And I'm mainly doing this because I'm lazy and I have the paint out. I haven't hammered the lid back on and we're all enjoying this construction session. We might as well do the job right instead of closing it all up and say, wait, why didn't we paint that, that top edge? Because the other, the other thing that's just occurring to me is once we paint the top edge, we can put those car card boxes back on and really feel like we've gotten somewhere that we can discuss the pros and cons of that in a minute. So can you see all the way over to the other side? Yeah. So I'm gonna just take my, my brown paint and I'm just gonna carefully paint the top of the fascia. And then I'm gonna put grass on the top of the fascia. Now, I guess you could, have, you could argue about why not just, put, just paint the fascia. My feeling is that the, 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 the coolest layouts I've ever seen are the one where there's a razor sharp edge between the scenery and the vertical surface of the fascia. So what I try to do, if I can, is make the top of the fascia have a little grass on it or scenic quality to it so that your eye doesn't get distracted by this big slab of green masonite in the middle of an otherwise nice railroad scene. Now this particular spot is a bit of an exception because we have those car card boxes we were just talking about, which ruin the scene anyway. So, you know, this is what I would call a minor improvement to an otherwise bad situation. Anyway, we have a lot of those on this railroad, both minor improvements and bad situations. Now, I know I said we don't care about what's under the track, but heck, we got, we're doing our scenery material. We might as well paint this and put grass on it. 
it just makes it more fun that way. Okay, so look at that. We've painted that spackle we just carved up and we painted this whole front or top edge and that means I'll put a little more just to make it nice and wet. You know, uh, uh, wood products like uh, this is a uh, masonite uh, um, hardboard, they tend to soak up water, you know, pretty, pretty strongly. So it's sometimes you do need to go back over it like I just did there. What happened to our grass? Where did I put it? Quick, quick. We need to apply the grass. I got done with it and I put it aside. Oh, here we go. All right. So we're going to start with the, do the same thing we did before. Start with a little bit of random dirt. Oops. And then put some random grass. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of a combination of um, dirt and grass or dried grass and green grass. Nothing too fancy about this. I just think that having the grass on top will keep the viewer from feeling like you're looking at a piece of masonite. I don't know, I might be wrong. I mean, there are, this particular situation where we have pavement here and gravel, maybe it would look better if it was, uh, if we seen it get to look like a retaining wall with, you know, just gray, whoops. Well, that's an interesting issue. That looks like a little brown paint got down there. So uh, uh, let's get another wet paper towel and get rid of that while it's still dry. I mean, wet. This is a, uh, what's the word? No rest for the wicked or something. It's like every time we turn around, we're doing something we weren't planning on. Okay. Now, what did we say? We said we're going to come through here and just make sure that we haven't gotten any paint we don't want on the front face. Now, this is really uh, obsessive compulsive what I'm doing right now because this is going to get covered up by the car card boxes, right? So why do I even need to do this? That's a really good question. Just satisfying my own inner perfectionist. That's the only reason. You see this, this paint I'm taking off right here? That's going to be covered up. As soon as we put the car card boxes back in, well, actually, that's not totally fair. Some of this area doesn't have car card boxes. It, uh, so, super cool. Okay, so now, see, now it's a perfect, like I was saying before, it's a perfect razor edge. We've taken the brown paint off the front fascia paint, take a dry piece here. Oh, can you see that all right on the video? Nice. Nice. Okay. Now, yeah, James says the devil is always in the details. Hello from Medford, Oregon. Great to see you. Um, so, um, I can't resist putting the car card boxes back. Can you think of any reason not to do that? We'll, we'll feel like we've accomplished something in the last few days. I still have the screwdriver here, the power screwdriver. So let's do it. This is the Bellingham one. Oh yeah, that's a good, good opportunity to show you a little bit of the layout. So this is this is the Bellingham uh, upper staging, and the upper staging is up here on the top level, the very top level there where the trees are. 
That's the Bellingham staging. And those are trains that are set to come down from Vancouver, Canada. There was a little bit of, oh, before I get carried away with this, let's put away the paint, huh? Well, wait, I already got carried away with it. So let's put the lid on the paint. You know, it's important not to leave latex paint out too much because it oxidizes and becomes garbage. So you don't want to keep it out too much. Now, if we're going to have a little... I'm just... Give me a second to put the paintbrushes in water. And I don't know if you can hear that, but that's what I did. And I'm going to take a little hammer and hammer on the top of the paint. And just as soon as I do that, we'll decide that we want to do some other painting somewhere. That's how it works, usually. Top didn't go on very well. You know, I used to operate over at Paul Scholes before he unfortunately died. And he, what he did with his quart jars of paint like this is to put them in a Ziploc bag so that no oxygen would get to them, which I'm going to start doing one of these days when I get organized. Now, what we were just talking about doing was re- and stating these car card boxes. So this was the Bellingham one, and that goes all the way over here. Now, the only reason we had that out was because, oh, look what happened. I wasn't paying attention, and the grass got blown away from the, from the hillside. I really like using square drive screws, so that's what this bit is in the tool, but we have a larger problem, which is that I rubbed up against this hillside and took the glue off. That probably means I have glue on my... Now, if that comes off again after the paint's dried, if it's still bald, obviously, as one of you just commented, you can we can put Elmer's glue on there with an eyedropper. The first um, stage, yeah, see, look, I got this on my, I, got, I, I touched this with my elbow. All right, never mind. So, um, where were, oh yeah, we're putting on these, we're putting on these other car card boxes. And I'm trying, oh, it's easy to remember which one is which because one of them has a little bit of, scenery taken out of it, which I'll show you. All right, here we go. We're going to stick this in here. Nice. That's not going anywhere. Now see that, that's, that, uh, that treatment of the dirt there. It, it creates a nice little effect. I like it. All right, and here's the last one. Can you see it? Oh no, you, I gotta change the angle for you. So here's the last uh, car card box going in here. It's got an existing hole. A little bit of a curve there. And see how this is, I cut actually cut a little angle on the car card box to fit in with the scenery. So this is looking really nice. If you ask me, we got the car card boxes. The scenery is kind of back. Uh, we haven't we haven't put gravel in here yet, but that will come. So, what do you think to reward ourselves? Uh, will we do a little test run? Is that a good idea or not? We haven't put any any ballast in there. But I don't know. How about if we uh, just spot a car 
at the maintenance of way track. Let's do that. We'll cheat a little bit so we don't have to wait for a bunch of interminable switching stuff to happen. And there's no room here. These are the cars that are going to go over to the the new sanding track. So what we're going to ooh, I got to be careful. I rubbed myself up against that hillside again. Um, it's easy to go back and fix these kinds of things. So let's just vacuum the track one more time. Do a little bit of There's a fair amount of There's a fair amount of, it was a loose gravel. I don't know if you could see that in the, in the video when I was vacuuming, but I'll turn on the layout and we'll run, get that switcher and we'll spot the car. All right, where's our switcher? Oh, here's our switcher. Are you getting sick of this same switcher? I don't know. Maybe no. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. We've got to use one of the new Rapido switchers with the rotating beacon. Stand by. This is worth waiting for. I promise. This model railroad is supposedly set in 1973. So they had painted some of the GN sw switchers uh, in the 160 two to 65 series. And so if this works, it'll work and that'll be cool. Okay, where were we? Oh, can you see this? All right, we're gonna select, uh-oh, we're getting a short. I've got files across the rail and all kinds of stuff there. Did that fix it? That's one thing about playing around with trains while you're doing construction is all it takes is a flat file to short out your track. So we're going to enter uh, 165. Enter. Oh, look at that. It worked. Turn on the sound. Turn on the front headlight, the rear headlight, and wait for it, the rotating beacon. Now this rotating beacon has got four little LEDs in it. And I, I think you probably saw, I had a, uh, a, a short video on this before, but that is super realistic. Look at that thing, unbelievable. Okay, so let's uh, start with a new camera shake here. Let's set this up so you can Now we're going to go down and get on the correct switch. Let's see if this works. Oh, we, we didn't clean the track. What the heck's wrong with me? Okay, just a second. Remember, we glued this switch down, and I, had, I took those weights off. But you've got to clean the track after, after you glue it down. Oh, of course, the other thing we haven't done is to install a ground throw. But hopefully that'll be all right. All right. So let's do this. This engine has hardly been used, but I did break it in a little bit. Can you hear the engine at all?
I like to set up my locomotives with brakes. So you have a fair amount of momentum, not too much, but enough that it's handy to use the brake. I'll show you this in a minute when we go pick up our car. You see that all right? Now we're coming in on the correct track. I don't have a switch machine on this, but we can finger flick it because it's nice and stiff. So we'll make sure everybody knows we're coming. A little bell. Ah. Now that's the frog. And have to clean the wheels. You should be able to get across the frog. It's got two powered trucks. But... So now I've got it off and I'm going to use the brake. And it's still kind of smashed into the car. But I don't think you even saw that. Sorry. Got to pay more attention to the videography here. And let's come out a little more. How about that? So, we'll go backwards. Release the brake. Oops, we didn't couple. How often has that happened to you? Oh, I see. Didn't quite couple. Needed to slam that on there. Sometimes that's just the problem with the... Uh, I sometimes tend to paint the couplers and little paint that's in there. Why are we doing this? because we like rail fanning and we're testing the, the new track. There's actually nothing wrong with this switch, except that it has a dead frog. And this is a new locomotive and I probably need to clean the, the wheels a little bit more so that it can definitely pick up current on both. Now see, if I put the brake, that stops it right there where the, where the uh, turnout points are. Uh, it, since I don't have a switch machine in here, ground throw might be a little picky. No pun intended there. Now I haven't really installed this track, so that uh, rail joiner might not work. But it looks like it's working pretty well. Nice. Like I said, the, the, the grade will be a little less serious. See, I needed to use the brake to stop that. Okay, now we can uncouple with any number of tools. I've got a dental pick here. If we're, oops, went right back again. Oh, that's because it's not level. Yeah. All right, here we go. Oops. No. Nope. There we go. The only reason that that's not level is that we haven't glued the track down over here on the right side. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to take the view away from you. So late now, huh? Okay, so we've spotted our first maintenance away car on a brand new maintenance away track. And we're heading out. See, it doesn't stall in the frog on this side. That proves that it's just a question of getting the wheels on the locomotive in a good way. Actually, we want to go back to the other track. Um, and go back to the back to our other cars. We'll take them over to the uh, sand tower track at some point. But all right, and I flip that switch and release the brake, and there we go. 
I'll see how well I can do with these other cars. And you, I put a little out because it's it's close. It's it's far away from the eight, which is the the sound function. So we'll just go and get our cars for the sand house for sand power. And then we'll see how how much yeah. Whoops. Break. Yeah. Nice. Now that's how it's supposed to be done. It still probably didn't stick, but here we go. And we'll just push that out of the way. And I'll give you one more chance to admire that rotating beacon. Oh yes. Very nice. Thank you, Rapido. Pay no attention to all those tools and supplies in the right of way. That container is a little skew there, but that container goes with the car repair shed. Very, very nice. Looks like we're going right into the yard there. I think I'll call that good. Now there's one more thing we could talk about, but we're already an hour and 10 minutes into this live stream. But if you like, we could talk slightly about switch machines. Let me just put that away, shut down the sound, which is, oh yeah, sorry. I'm glad it sounds good. Thank you. Now, I may need a frog juicer there. You're right. Uh, but first, I'm going to try cleaning the wheel engine wheels. So if I hit this F8 button, it's going to do this the sequence where it shuts down the sound. But I don't know how well you can hear it that far away. But now we don't have any engine noise to deal with. So just one more subject, and then we'll call it good. Now that we've done some rail fanning, I feel a little better. Um, if we come back here and look at this turnout we just installed, we have a PC, we have a PC board throw rod, which is this, you can see the yellow. Now I can paint this a darker color, but um, we're going to be putting in here, we're going to be putting in a ground throw, very similar to what's over here. Um, and where you can see there's a uh, cork pad and I'll, I'll put the ground throw right on the cork pad. Now in this case, the points are so close together because I used the NMRA standards gauge for, for that when I rebuilt this old Shinohara turnout that I can use the end scale version of the ground throws like I've been using uh, over here on all these microengineering turnouts. See, like there's an end scale uh, Caboose Hobbies ground throw, and that's a standard uh, microengineering turnout. So, um, the without going, well, I can grab one and show it to you, but you probably know what it looks like already. I may or may not have it one handy anyway. I can't believe I might have used my last one. That would be typical. Um, now I'm going to have to gonna have to dig dig around. Oh, there we go. Wait a minute. In scale, yeah. Two. This is number two hundred six S. Now this two hundred six S is designed for. Uh, Oh, gosh. Sorry about the telephoto. The 206S is designed for N scale because of the amount of throw in it. See, it says maximum travel of 0.135 inch. 
N scale. It turns out that's also perfect for HO scale if you're using uh, close points. Uh, they're DCC friendly turnouts. And I think you all understand what I'm talking about. The, when you rebuild this, the, the, these can be closer together, these points, because the polarity of these are connected together by a, by a soldered uh, wire. So we don't have to worry about any kind of short here. Uh, so that's why they're so much closer. But what that means is we can use this guy to uh, throw it because it, we don't need more than 0.135 inches. Um, and uh, thanks, James. Glad you were here. He's leaving. I'll, I'll, I'll be leaving soon, too. I just want to go through um, a little bit of discussion about uh, the preparation of putting in the ground throw. So the, the thing we need here is some sort of a pad. First of all, we need to decide, is it on this side or that side? And I think it's pretty obvious that this is the best location. Um, so, and then of course, there's a question of how close do we want it, uh, which I'll get into later. But the main thing we wanna do right now, since we're working on the railroad, is we wanna take, we wanna smooth this out get rid of this stuff and put in a piece of cork so that we have something to glue the we want a nice flat surface there so we can put a piece of cork in there. Let's vacuum all that gravel out of there. Whoops, oh, that was clever. I put the tripod leg right down on the strap for the... All right, boy, that vacuum cleaner really comes in handy, doesn't it? All right. Where was I? Oh, I can blow this up a little bit now. So what we want to do is put a little piece of cork in there. And the best thing would be to find a piece that we can use. Now here's a here's a nice piece of cork. Uh, this normally made for, it's a split piece for, you know, laying regular track. If we take our X-Acto knife, and we just, here, let me give you a little more room here. We take our X-Acto and we're gonna just glue this right on here. And I like, I kind of like that tapered angle a little bit. So I'll just cut, I'll cut a similar angle over here. There's really nothing too fancy about this. I'm just slicing it. And you can slice and break this cork pretty well, just to save time. And when I, when I stick it in here, there's a couple of things to notice. One is it doesn't fit quite on the side of the hillside, so we can trim the side out. And we don't need to go over that far. So there, I trimmed the side out. So now this should fit okay. But the other thing I'm concerned about is I don't want this uh, being impacted at all by the cork material. So I'm gonna cut a little slot out in the middle here just to free up the throw rod. And we don't need we don't need that throw rod to hit any any material at all. So see, I'm just taking a little chunk out of there. And then when we put this back here, it will be able to move without binding on any cork. See that? So it, it, that way we know for sure we don't have any clear, any um, obstruction problems. So all we need to do now is take a little bit of, don't you love that phrase, all you need to do now? Um, a little bit of white glue, diluted white glue, stick it down on there and then uh, 
put a weight on it. I don't know why my hand's shaking so much. I think it's, uh, what do you call that? There's a word for it. it. Happens to older people. I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to have it. The shaky hand thing. That looks to me like a little too much glue, but it's all right. It'll go away. It'll it'll get absorbed. And of course, I put um, you know a wetting agent in the like detergent or something in the glue, so that'll make sure it'll be sucked up before it dries. Let me see that close up. So I've got um, a, a free clear way for the um, ground for the uh, throw rod. And if you were here last time we cut a slot in the cork under here for this throw rod. So now we have the entire throw rod free and we'll just make a decision uh, after this is set, we'll make a decision which of these two pins to use in the hole that I've already drilled in the throw rod. Um, I'm, I may use the, I, I probably will use the longer one farther away because that just reduces the problems you have with clearance. So the only thing we're missing now is a weight on that. And that, we could do a number of ways, but I think I'll just take a piece of stone that I have here and stick it on there, weight it down. Now let's check it one more time and make sure we got that slot in the right place. If we didn't, you know, it's easy to go back with an X-Acto knife and trim cork. That's one of the reasons it's such a universal model railroading um, material. So, uh, Oh yeah, pre-paint the the uh, the uh, cork the same color as the ballast is a really good idea too. Great stuff, thank you. Who was that? Oh, James Carey. James, do you go by James or Jim? Um, all right. Well, I'm going to call that enough to do in one day. Thanks for joining us. And uh, next time we'll probably be working on the the track over there for the for the um, sand towers. I'll just show you that for a second, so you know what I'm talking about. I move the light over here. In in some of my previous live streams, there was a along this black line there was a third engine track. So I removed it, moved it over here, glued it down. Now it's permanent. And we're gonna make some final decisions about where to position this, this uh, cement here, cement pad. We're gonna have five sand towers here per the prototype engine facility. And just for fun, I decided to put a switch in, in here so that we, were, we, could, we could spot these uh, sand cars, which were a super cool feature of the um, Great Northern and then the BN, these little tiny uh, cut off covered hoppers for sand. And the sand came from a factory called Northwest Olivine up on the concrete branch. And I have a model of that on the layout. So I'm able to bring locomotive sand down from the actual place that manufactured it and um, spot it in the engine terminal. And while we're talking about this, let's just go over and take a look at Northwest Olivine. So uh, this is the rest of the interbay yard, as we've seen before. Um, there was a steel fabricator over here called Sabota Steel and I have a friend who's working on a backdrop model of that, which will be cool. We'll cover that later, downtown Seattle. Anyway, we, when we wander all around the layout, we end up at the Burlington Yard, which is up here. We need light on this part of the layout, don't we? I wasn't intending to give a tour. Okay, so there's the lovely Mount Baker on the backdrop, which is a 10,000 foot peak in the Cascade Range quite near the Burlington Yard. And then off to the east, up into the Cascade Mountains was something called the 
um, cascade uh, the sorry uh, concrete branch because it went to a concrete factory at one point uh, which shut down before 1973 but there was still a sand uh, mining operation called northwest olivine and that's the sign telling you that's the the hoppers and so that uh, sawed off covered hopper that i showed you in the engine terminal is going to, after many hours of operating fun, end up being switched up to this Northwest Olivine hopper. It's been great working with you, and um, I'll say goodbye now. Until the next time, thanks for joining us, and have fun with trains in the meantime. Bye.